as it turned out, they did call back and had another position. Um, the position was stated to be something that was involving uh, a field propulsion system, which to me, in my mind, sounded something along the lines of uh, some electromagnetic propulsion, uh, something that might be used in space, maybe, uh, I don't know, an ion drive system using mercury vapor or something like that. Or, you, you've, or always, no. you've always been fascinated by propulsion systems. Anything, anyway. anything with, you know, it exerts tremendous amount of energy from, you know, explosives to, uh, you know, high energy weapons, anything along those lines, propulsion and uh they, um, and coincidentally, the article that Dr. Teller was reading was about a car that I had converted to run on a, a jet engine. Now, you see, I remembered that. And then you, you converted another one, I believe, to run on hydrogen, didn't you? Yeah, actually, I'm really surprised that you remember that. I don't remember. I have a good... So that is one of the number one things I get asked about. I know. I have a good memory about it. Hmm. For some, um, I'm for envious some of that. <laughs> um, but in either case, I, I um, after a more or less lengthy interview, I um, uh, accepted the job. And, uh, of course, I had to go back a second time. Can you remember any of the details of this rather lengthy interview? I mean, w was a lot of it security-oriented? Uh, security well, there was certainly a lot of security-oriented uh, security questions and so forth later on. However, keep in mind that I had just come from Los Alamos just a, a few or a couple of years before That's true. Uh, where I had Q clearance, civilian, you know, top secret clearance. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, and they really didn't have to go and dig deep back into my past to see if I was, you know, of Russian descent or you know, <laughs> anything along those lines. So, um, uh, you basically the, the job just seemed like a... Uh, you know, typical research and development job. I was anxious to get started on it, and uh, things went on. They all they told me is that it was in a remote area out in the desert, and um, that I would initially I would fly out there maybe once, possibly twice a week, uh, just to kind of get caught up on stuff. And they had to um, uh, reinstate my clearance, which would take you know perhaps a couple weeks, uh, maybe a month at the latest. Sure. And um, so in the meantime, I was given busy, essentially busy work to do, or at least that's how it rang in my mind. And this is typical, too, at Los Alamos. You know, if uh, you're initially hired there before your clearance goes through, sometimes, you know, obtaining Q clearance can take up to 13 months. So they don't just have you sit at home. You'll, you know, before you go to work for the lab, sit around and work on alarm systems or something like that. doesn't, you know... Uh, something usually <laughs> below your potential, but uh, no, something that, to keep that, you busy. That rings true. I was in the Air Force. They did that to us all the time. Yeah, it's, it's pretty. It, it's pretty common. So I thought, well, this you know, very typical. Um, I had no idea what this would actually entail until I got into it. And obviously, they, looking through their eyes, I guess it it made sense that they couldn't they couldn't, of course, divulge what this job had would actually entail before they had, uh, you know, gone through all the security uh, and whatnot. But, um, you know, that's essentially how the job came about. All right. One thing that I would think you would remember is your impressions of Mr. Teller. I do, as far as what? Well, what kind of guy was he? You know, just simple questions. What kind of guy was he? He was... Um, he seems to have two faces, you know, which is strange. In, in talking to him one-on-one, uh, -on -one, he's a very polite, pleasant, intelligent man. Um, however, virtually any interview you'll see of this guy, he comes across as the most pompous, mean person you have ever run into in your life. <laughs> pompous and mean. Um I don't know how else to describe him, but um, he was not nearly as short, uh, not physically speaking, but I mean, uh, you know, if you see him in interviews, you'll see him answer questions specifically to the point, short, and on to the next question, mm -hmm. and uh, not be very talkative, 
not offer any information you know other than what you're immediately talking about and, and in person he was certainly not that way so he was you know the exact opposite very pleasant and willing to talk about anything of course, well, we didn't, we last, didn't talk about any right. nuclear weapons or anything oh well that's what i was going to ask about last night i interviewed uh, professor michio kaku uh never heard of him a very um a preeminent physicist uh, back at new york university and he too has worked with uh, professor teller and I asked Professor Kaku why he had not participated in the hydrogen bomb uh, development. And he said he simply chose not to. He wanted to go into a, a different direction with physics and um, had quite a bit to say about uh, Edward Teller. And apparently he was consumed during the Cold War years with national security, you know, with uh, being concerned about national security and... Uh, this is uh, Dr. Teller you're talking yes, about. Yes, uh-huh, and uh, developing uh, bombs. And, in fact, even today, um, the programs go on, I guess, with the third generation of uh, hydrogen bombs, the, uh, sort of designer bombs, Professor Kaku said. Anyway, that's why I asked you about uh, Edward Teller. Listen, uh, everybody hold tight. We're at the bottom of the hour, and we'll be right back. Uh, Bob Lazar and Gene Huff are my guests, and the story that you're about to hear unfold will curl your hair. I'm Art Bell. This is Coast to Coast AM. Now back to Bob Lazar and Gene Huff. Gentlemen, you're back on the air again. All right, Bob. Uh, so, you, you got the job. You landed the job, and they had you doing busy work. And then what? Well, not uh, busy work hadn't started. Oh. Um, that's what I thought was going to happen. Uh, instead, um, where did we leave off? Um, well, actually, with busy work, they were kind of. Well, that's, you know. He had anticipated busy work, but now you had to go to work the first day. Yeah, essentially. I, I guess essentially it was to get caught up. Uh, with what was going on, and really, to my surprise, the security was a little more than oppressive. Um, you know, generally, you're just assigned a badge and shown the general procedures and, and things of that sort. Um, this was a little different. Are you still talking about the facility near Las Vegas, or are you talking about being flown up there now? No, this is when finally I was flown. Okay. Um, so they... I go to uh, McCarran Airport right by the EG&G building, and right. I'd be flown to Groom Lake. Um, as I landed there the first time, right across from where the plane parked, um, there's a security officer, was a security office. Um, and that's, I, I believe I spent quite a while there, but, uh, you know, reviewing, you know, how secure things are, so on and so forth. But, um, you know, this is not where I worked. Where I did work was about, from my estimates, about 10 or 15 miles south of there. We were taken there in a uh, converted school bus, you know, those big bluebird uh, jobs that was painted kind of a dark navy blue. There's a lot of people, Bob, who don't even believe that Area 51 exists, by the way, much less S4. I live out here in Pahrump. Uh, Bob, well, I think, I mean, people... I can tell people you. People don't believe Area 51 exists? Well, there are a lot of people who don't. But I can tell you, Bob, when, when you drive up by the VFW here in Pahrump at about 4.30 or 5 in the morning, there's a whole bunch of buses out there, and mm -hmm. they've got signs right on the side of the buses. I, I saw it about a month ago, and it just says Area 51. Oh, really? Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> well, they're not, <laughs> not bothering anymore to keep that secret. I guess. 